may come to order here a little bit. I'd like to like to introduce our next speaker. Am I coming through all right? Oh, I guess so. Okay, Mr. Jim Sparks, author of The Keepers. He has full conscious recall, did not require hypnotic induction or anything else to recover, to recall what happened to him as he was experiencing. So he's going to give you the benefit of his full knowledge and full conscious recall in the material and that like he used to write the keepers and he's working on other projects too. So if you come out, Jim. Jim Spark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Or, let's see, not too loud, right? How's this? Pretty good? Uh, today or this evening or late this afternoon, I'd like to share with you <coughs> excuse me, some of the reasons why it's uh, pretty difficult for extraterrestrials uh, to uh, interact with us on a relative, relatively normal basis. Um, so a lot of people might say, well, gee, how come they don't, uh, well, you've heard the typical, uh, why don't they land on the White House lawn thing, but even deeper than that, why aren't they uh, knocking on the door and why can't you say come on in and have a cup of coffee and things of that nature? So what I'd like to do is go over some of the reasons as to why it's like that and why it's so difficult. Uh, for myself personally, it's been going on for 19 years, uh, and the first six years for me were pretty traumatic, um, horrific, uh, I, at the say the least, uh, messed up my life pretty good, but after that first six years and understanding the nature of the beast, which I'm going to share with you, uh, it, it was, there's reason for the way it was in that way. And of course, in the last uh, 13 years, I've, um, these interactions have uh, evolved to a point where there's a lot of learning, a lot of knowledge, and some messages. Uh, I'll speak on that aspect of it for about uh, 30 minutes or so, more or less, and then we're going to see a video. And primarily the reason we're going to see this video is because it's another interesting aspect, I believe, of the phenomena, which is um, I've had, uh, in this particular occasion, uh, in an abduction. It was a mass abduction. Hundreds of people were involved and there were a few individuals that were close to me during this abduction that I'd never met here at home but that I was interacting with dur during this particular event. Uh, it was one of the first times, if not the first time actually, that I was able to move freely uh, without being paralyzed uh, and kind of help in this abduction because it was an environmental lesson, part of the campaign of what they were doing. But this one individual by the name of uh, Doug, Douglas Rodante uh, was, I was calming, I was walking through the whole scenario. And in all these experiences, I can't, there wasn't a time that I, at least up to that point, where I actually saw a person here back home uh, months after the event, which took my breath away when I first laid eyes on him, and then to watch what he had done and watch what the lessons were that he had gotten on board that day with hundreds of many others, and they actually abducted tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, millions globally, all in, for environmental reasons, which I'll get into, and to see what he did with what he got. Most of the memory was taken away from, from almost everybody that was there, except for when it was time for them to act, and, and all that was positive. But uh, this particular individual stuck out, and um, that's what the, the video is going to have him narrating the video, because he had a little video production company. And also, uh, John Mack, Professor Mack, even Hopkins, and Bud Hopkins, and a lot of the other greats are in the thing. It's not a commercial, it's not for sale, it's a, sort of a, just a, a documentary. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll go over a little bit about what that, that major, what I call a major abduction was for myself and I think the planet, and what, what the message was. But in re retrospect or respect to these uh, non-human intelligent beings, 
my interactions primarily have been with commonly what are referred to as grays. I would say 95 to 98 percent. Uh, the other three to five percent would be what are commonly referred to as uh, reptilians. They have scales, so I just know they have scales, so that's what people label them as that. But the, uh, the grays in particular, thank you, it's okay. <laughs> the uh, grays in particular, for starters, why is it that it, uh, it's not very nice to be around these guys? First of all, they radiate an energy. It's, uh, it's a miserably uncomfortable energy. It's something that uh, you can detect uh, even as far as 50 or 100 feet away. Uh, I believe it to be primarily natural. Uh, as, as one of those um, non-human intelligent beings gets closer and closer pro proximity to you, your heart starts to race. And this is what I've even seen uh, the being yet. Uh, your breath, it becomes short and rapid. Your spine will straighten out. As they get even closer, uh, your, uh, the chemicals in your, that are normally regulated in your, by your brain all at once will start dumping into your system. So all, all of a sudden you have all this adrenaline in your system, you have all the, the sense of fear, the sense of confusion, and, and it's not um, unusual as they are within a few feet of you to black out. So that in itself kind of makes it difficult for them to knock on the door and say, hey, come on in. Uh, they can scan your brain. And what I mean by that is um, there's no privacy. These are the things that took me six years to get over. This was all trauma in that six years, but once I started understanding these things and, 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 and getting used to, to the way it was, and then it made it easier for me to learn and listen to basically what they were saying. But we as human beings have a natural and normal facade about us. Uh, if when I first meet you or you first meet me, I'm going to tell you the things that I want to tell you and likewise you're going to say that to me. But deep inside there's things that we're hiding, it's natural. Maybe things that embarrassed, embarrassed us in our past or maybe there's some things we're ashamed of or there's some things that we had done and, and we overcame them and, and all those things that are private about us as human beings and that's the real you. That's the part of you that's there, and then there's this surface you that communicates with other people. This is natural and normal. But when it comes to a uh, being that's 100% telepathic, and, and then when it communicates with you, it cuts, cuts right through that normal and natural facade and lays all your, your insides on the table, raw. So everything about you, everything you've ever hidden, everything you've ever known is energized, it's flashing before your eyes. They're talking to the real you, and that's not natural, and that's not normal, and that in itself makes it extremely difficult to be around something like that. They screen image, meaning that uh, they can um, take thoughts in their mind and uh, transmit that thought as an image inside yours so you can, in a sense, see what they're thinking. But at the same token, uh, their mental uh, capacity or abilities are such that it can, if they choose to, they can make what you're seeing seem like reality. And so I, I, I noticed during particular mass abduction scenarios that whatever it takes to keep people calm for whatever procedures that they were up to, in other words, if someone was thinking that uh, I'm in heaven and I'm seeing God, then they're going to screen image that sort of a play for them in their mind, and so they go along with the abduction scenario without trauma. If there's other people who are scared of the devil and they think they're seeing demons, then they'll uh, project that sort of image as if you don't cooperate, the devil's going to get you kind of thing, and it keeps them scared, and they do. So they screen image. That has taken years for me to shake off the screen imaging. Uh, another thing that's pretty intimidating is the fact that their thought process is anywhere from 10 to 100 times faster. Intimidating meaning that you're always conscious of the fact that whatever it is you're thinking, they're thinking 10 to 100 times faster than that. So there were a lot of times where a question would almost be answered before I had 
the question. So I would be getting the answer before I had the question. And it's just a really odd feeling because before you can even think something or get a breath out of your mouth, there's an answer. And then you said, yeah, I was going to ask that question. So they have to slow way down to communicate. So just, just, just the things I just mentioned here, which, are a natural, which is natural for these beings, make it very difficult for them to come on and say, hi, how you doing? Your planet's in trouble, and here's what we should do. Uh, to go even further, we got uh, beings that um, can travel time. To them, it's just, it's nothing. It means it's, it's almost boring to them. They can go any, anywhere in time, anytime they would like. And the technology that they use to get them to these different points in time is as simple as someone using a remote control, uh, just a gizmo. So now you got beings that travel time. They can also travel dimensions or dimensions. That's a good one. Uh, that's a technology that's also used to go from point A to point B which they use other dimensions in which to do it. In these other dimensions, there are things that truly do exist. You've got beings now that uh, can be completely invisible. Again, this is, all of this is due to technology. Invisibility. You've got beings that can walk through walls. Again, it's technology. Uh, so when you put all of these things together, it makes it very extremely difficult to interact with uh, what, again, are commonly referred to greys, and particularly this species of greys. So my first six years, uh, these guys came to this individual uh, out of the blue, out of nowhere, with all of this. And um, with me having no clue that anything like that was going to happen, I think what made myself stand out through most of this is the fact that um, I was filled with so much animosity, anger, focused hate. I loathed them. And those first six years were like a living hell. And then at the end of six years, uh, almost to the day, at least to the month, I should say, um, the, the interaction evolved to something that was phenomenal. Um, and one of the first, uh, in that, in that six-year period, I was always paralyzed. I was always in the same place on board um, and pushed by bizarre experiments, um, converting uh, symbols and so forth, uh, or our, our language into different symbols and a different way to telepathically communicate. I was learning, which I now know, the basics for um, telepathic communication, which can happen with any human being, uh, the ability to take um, 20 or 30 pages of text, put it in symbol form, which vibrates uh, with motion and direction, and you just glance at it, and then you get the whole information just as a person, and you, know, you understand the whole 20 or 30 pages. Um, the, best, the best way for me to describe something like that would be to, to give an example would be movies. A movie might be an hour and a half, an hour, two and a half hours, two hours and 20 minutes. And so if I were to say to you, Old Yeller, the first thing that happens is you relive that movie in a nanosecond, everything about it from the beginning to the end. But in the case of these beings, uh, there was a transformation to learn, to convert uh, thoughts, symbols, ideas, and, and compress it into something the size of a, uh, between a quarter and a 50 cent piece, and all you'd have to do is glance at it, and then you would have that entire movie in your head as if you watched the whole two or three hours of it. So, um, in those first six years, all those things were drilled into me in combination of all the things that I was saying here that made it very difficult to be with them. But something remarkable happened after six years, and there was a mass abduction, and I'm going to go into the detail of that mass abduction and what it had to do with um, regarding the, uh, a message to our planet and about our planet and the environment of our planet, which started this thing started making a lot more sense. But what I'd like to share with you now is um, this video, which uh, there's a, um, I've got an overlay uh, that should be coming up here. 
um, on the screen. I met this gentleman during this experience, and I calmed this gentleman during the experience. I walked him through the entire experience. Um, and then several months later, I actually saw him. I, I happened to be at a conference, and he had a giant video camera on his shoulder. And I remember standing there outside, and he was walking by the sidewalk, and he was carrying this huge camera, and it was wobbly, because he had a video production company. And I said to myself, I said, oh my god, that's that guy. I remembered him instantly, but I never said anything to him. I bit my tongue, and he walked right by me, and then he stopped, and the, cam the camera kind of wobbled because it was heavy, it was wobbling in his body, and he turned around, and he started talking to me. And I let several months go by before I revealed that uh, because he was, <laughs> he talked about, he had fragmented memories about it, and I, uh, I let several months go by to see where this thing would go because I happen now to run into an individual who, no, it would be the next one, the one with um, the, the other overlay with the three ships and the guy in the corner. Yeah, the second overlay, please. Yeah, that's it. Um, that gentleman there to the far right uh, on the screen, um, I had a sketch artist long before I saw him walking around. Uh, and she would work very diligently in, in re uh, me relaying to her that my experiences and her sketching these things. And um, that was the guy that stood out throughout that entire abduction scenario with me the most. It was my first ma uh, mass abduction. It was my first uh, time that I actually interacted and helped with this mass abduction, which I don't claim to embrace uh, alien culture, and I have a healthy suspicion of them all the time. But in this particular scenario, it was, it was very fruitful. And so he stuck with me because this is a guy that just stuck out through the whole thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to see a video um, that was made several years ago. Uh, probably 10 years ago, it's going to have a lot of the speakers that you see today. Uh, it's not for sale, it's not commercial, it's nothing like that, but it's something that Doug had put together with myself, and of course yours truly is in there. And then after watching the video, we're going to uh, go over that experience about uh, the mass abduction and the, uh, the environmental lessons that are being taught. like that, but the, the, the person that's the narrator in this uh, video happens to be this person, Doug. Now, this is a person on board who got the lessons that I'm about to tell you after this, uh, this is over. It may be human nature to wonder if other intelligent life exists in the universe That's him. or perhaps other dimensions. Within 54 light years of Earth in our own galaxy, there are at least a thousand stars, 46 of which are similar to the sun in that planets orbit them. Scientists say it is feasible to have life on at least one out of 22 of these planets. If this is so, the question is, are we being visited by extraterrestrials? Well, the United States government officially says no, even though they outline UFO history and hazards in their official field guide to disaster control. Internal requests by Congress to release information pertaining to incidents that have happened decades ago, such as the famous UFO retrieval of Roswell, New Mexico, have continually been denied. The Air Force put out a, a uh, a new report that said, indeed, this wasn't the weather balloon that, we, uh, that we've uh, said it was. It was uh, something called Project Mogul, which was supposed to be a high-altitude, low-frequency listening device uh, suspended by balloons in the upper atmosphere to des uh, designed to detect possible Soviet nuclear testing, which, of course, wouldn't actually uh, it wouldn't happen for two more years and would theoretically take us by surprise at that point. 
one particularly interesting note was that a lot of files have been, uh, have been destroyed, uh, evidently some decades ago, without the proper uh, paper trail that would, that would document where they went. Additional evidence to a government cover-up at Roswell was discovered during a research project at Curlin Air Force Base by award-winning filmmaker and author Linda Howe. Our government was retrieving what was described in this uh, alleged government document. They were retrieving crashed disks and non-human entities, both alive and dead, prior to July of 1947 in the now famous Roswell incident. That would mean that the Truman administration already knew about disks and non-human entities before the uh, crash between Corona and Roswell. And it may also be why that there was a leak, but they were prepared to handle the leak with the weather balloon story. The issue of the government cover-up policy, and the reason why it, it's so damaging, is because the government, by saying UFOs don't exist and therefore abductions don't exist, they're telling every single person who's had this experience, you didn't have this experience. The official policy is you didn't have it. You're either a liar or you're somehow mentally deranged. You didn't have this experience. That's the effect of the government policy. That's the effect of the damage that it does to human beings because obviously that official policy then uh, filters down to uh, psychiatrists, uh, school counselors, rabbis, priests, you name it. All of whom are equipped to say officially, based on what the government has said, you didn't have this experience. You had some, something else. You're either lying or you're uh, mentally ill. The explanation still given to many is that these sightings are man-made objects, perhaps even military. Veteran pilot and forensic scientist David Rudd explains the results of a seven-second close encounter with a bright yellow cylindrical-shaped object traveling at an estimated speed of over 5,000 miles per hour. It would have been going down at about 5,200 miles an hour, and to go to straight and level, the delta V right there at the point where it went from a down angle to straight and level would have subjected that to about 237 G's, which is pretty substantial for anything to go like that. Human body will black out at about uh, eight or nine G's, the standard person will. So. <laughs> John Mack, MD, is professor of psychiatry at the Cambridge Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and founding director of the Center for Psychology and Social Change. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Dr. Mack is a groundbreaking pioneer of abduction research and is author of the recent best-selling book, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. There's not a sh bit of evidence that any of these craft are, are man-made. They don't behave like uh, uh, aircraft uh, or missiles that have been constructed by human beings. They don't follow the laws of gravity. They appear to be, uh, if not extraterrestrial, at least uh, coming into our atmosphere uh, by uh, some principle we don't understand, perhaps from another dimension. You put all this together, you say that if we Earthlings could build things like that in the 40s and 50s, we would no longer be building F-16s, 17s, 18s, MiG-29s, Mirage 5s. Since we are still building those aircraft, what was observed back then wasn't built here. And if it wasn't built here, it was built someplace else. Therefore, by definition, it's extraterrestrial. For a long time, from the 40s through the 60s at least, uh, most of ufology or the formal study of UFOs tended to deal in these claims that objects were flying around. Uh, since that time, uh, and most especially now uh, in the 90s, uh, the focus of attention has shifted to uh, claims that human beings are encountering unusual uh, beings uh, of off-world origin or alien origin. They were hairless. They didn't have slanted eyes. Their eyes were straight across. Um, they were dark. Um, they had not a real large nose, but it was more, it wasn't flat. And they had small nostrils and they had very thin lips, but their mouths didn't open. Eyewitness accounts began to accumulate of actual face-to-face -face encounters with something that would be in the category of four feet tall, grayish green skin, enormous black slanted eyes, and what the eyewitnesses say are non-human entities. Claims of conscious face-to-face -face encounters with extraterrestrials are not as common as the quote, dream-like abduction experiences 
which are happening worldwide. Estimates range from hundreds of thousands to several million people in the United States have had these experiences in, uh, around the world, although the, there are reports from many countries of, these, uh, of this phenomenon, there are no reliable data. So far as I can tell, I've never seen any absolute pattern that would suggest a type of person uh, who has had abduction experiences. I've dealt with everything under the sun. I've dealt with, uh, <clears throat> just in terms of professions, I had a, a NASA research scientist come to me as an abductee. I've had, uh, so far, eight psychiatrists come to me because of their abduction experiences. I've had police officers, military, um, people in uh, show business, well-known people. Cuts across uh, uh, economic groups, racial groups, or black Jews, Protestants, Catholics, you name it. Black, white, old, young, rich, poor, straight, gay, every possible uh, type you can imagine. And I've, I've worked in places like uh, Brazil, Australia, uh, Europe, working with abductees there. So it's a global phenomenon. There are not enough words to describe the extreme emotions one may feel when coming in contact with extraterrestrial beings. There's a great deal of mystery and misunderstanding associated with this phenomenon due to partial or no recall in many abductees. However, top researchers like David Rubian have singled out a gentleman by the name of Jim Sparks who has almost complete total recall. His abduction experiences have brought amazing insight into an otherwise speculative alien agenda. Jim remembers more than any other individual I've come in contact with uh, without the benefit of hip hypnosis. But his experiences not only are so vivid and what he's actually has gone through, but I can see that what he's telling is the truth. The Jim Sparks story is one of the most significant in the human abduction syndrome because the majority of his experiences he ex had as an experience consciously. The fact that Jim has had those recollections and other people have had them too and uh, they, they seem reliable, they seem a pattern, of course adds credibility to Jim in general. And uh, so I've had never a reason to doubt his credibility. Well, I think it's valuable that Jim uh, Sparks has uh, made a record in such detail of the information that's come to him, the language that he's uh, taken down the rapidity with which uh, he notices that uh, information comes to him in this process and so it, it's very concrete and can be uh, compared with what to what other people report and again gives a certain authenticity and validity to it if uh, we find that uh, others are uh, having the same experiences and, and uh, putting down the same formulations and, and symbols because it's not something that somebody could really make up on their own. There's an estimated hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of people around the world who have abduction experiences that are fragmented, uh, some with no conscious recall at all. Why are you one of the few that has almost 95 percent total recall? Well, I, I feel it might be for um, several reasons, but one in particular is that I never went along with any agenda that they had in mind. Uh, I, one could say that I fought them tooth and nail. You didn't cooperate with them no, at all? No, it's particularly in the early years. Was that harder on you? In uh, much. I think it brought out the, the, I think the will or the fight uh, against them brought out the ability for me to retain a lot of the things that were going on. Secondly, I believe that uh, there are humans that for whatever reason they pick them, they want to retain the memory or the experience of the abduction. I just happen to be one of those. What is your emotional state when you come face to face with these beings? Well, I've been dealing with them for nine years now. The first several years, it was horrible. How horrible? Pure trauma. Well, for starters, you're somewhere that you don't want to be. That in itself is scary. I didn't want anything to do with this. Period. I would imagine it'd be hard to accept the fact that it's happening at all. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that, uh, getting into that, it's, Accepting it yourself is one thing, explaining it to others is another. Right. The aliens themselves radiate an energy or a vibration that paralyzes you. Uh, fear, yeah, sure, you're paralyzed in fear, but it also paralyzes your mind and your body. I, I know it's, there's a lot of fear connected with it, and there certainly was in my life, but 
It's not a form of mental illness. It's not a progressive physical disease. We know those things because we're all still fine after years of having had it. These experiences are complex, ambiguous. Um, we have no control over them. And they're very, very difficult to deal with. When you're abducted, how often does this occur and what happens in the abduction process? It happened uh, quite often, uh, in some cases two, maybe four times a month. Here in the last few years, uh, perhaps uh, it's twice a year, maybe two times or three times a year at the most. Mm -hmm. And when you get abducted, how, how does that take place exactly? Well, there's, there's two ways in my uh, experience that one goes. Uh, one way I call the easy way, which uh, the worker beings escort you from your home or in some cases your car to their craft. One goes the easy way when the crafts are on the ground. I think one goes the, what I call the hard way when they're actually in flight or hovering over your home. Uh, the hard way involves a, uh, typically I'm sleeping, and then I'll, 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 I'll be woken up, and then I'll go back to sleep, sort of like a second sleep or an unnatural second sleep. But uh, I'll be awakened to a, uh, a low-pitched, uh, low RPM whirling sound that sounds sort of like a whipping whirling sound. I'll hear it in my head and it'll get louder and louder and louder, tremendously loud. Then I would lose consciousness and then the next thing, uh, when I regain consciousness, the next thing I knew is I would be there. So you're not aware of what happens between point A and point B? Uh, better than 99% of the time, no you're not. Evidence suggests that through advanced technology our current laws of physics simply do not apply. It seems extraterrestrials have the ability to create a field which, among other things, renders invisibility and even interdimensional transport, whereas time seems to be manipulated at will. Aliens have even been seen walking through walls. To me, it's like uh, any other technology. For example, a television. It's probably the most simplest tool in the world for one to use. Uh, on, off, change the channels. However, if one were to tear it apart, if you weren't a technician to try and figure it out, it would be, it would be beyond comprehension. The same thing with their technology. Uh, uh, they are advanced cultures. After all, they can come here. And to us, when we look at the technology, it seems extremely complicated, almost uh, magical, as a matter of fact. To coin a phrase, their technology is so advanced, it seems like magic. But however, after seeing it time and time and time and time again, and uh, not being traumatized by it because of familiarity, uh, I notice that it's a field they create somehow, and it enables all these wonders. So you become things. somehow acclimated to the field. Yes, but you're always scared to death. Uh, perhaps the trauma doesn't, or the fear doesn't last as long each time. But yeah, there's always an overwhelming fear at first because it is completely unnatural. According to Jim, their technology also allows them to literally be 80% in one dimension and work 20% in another. In some cases, that is why they can be seen as transparent. You can see right through them because 20% of their working essence is here and 80% may be somewhere else, or whatever number they choose, for example, 50, 50, 90, 10, etc. Extraterrestrials, in a lot of cases, can be mistaken as spirits, demons, angels, and I think that's been going out through, through, through history. What other activities are associated with being abducted? Well, there seems to be, in almost every case that I'm aware of, poltergeist type activities. Which Why is that? They literally um, go through dimensions in order to go from point A to point B. And, and what I've also learned uh, in my experience is that there are, there are other types of uh, entities or things that exist in other dimensions that perhaps are spirits or ghosts. Uh, for all I know, and it, may, it may even be uh, humans. Are you saying that they, they follow die. these beings through these dimensions when th these holes or portals yeah, are opened up? Yeah, I think up? doorways are opened up. After your return, then, you hear noises. You do, so or so you can be and angry, or if your emotions are really strummed up, something can fall in a back room. Now, how does that tie in? I'm not sure, but I do know things like that go hand in hand uh, during and after the use of extraterrestrial technology. Most of the peoples of the Earth, except the Western uh, man of the past uh, two or three hundred years, has been aware of other intelligences that come from 
other dimensions and enter into our world. They were called uh, spirits or divas or whatever, and, and they were accepted by other cultures. We've simply uh, rid ourselves or uh, destroyed the, the capability of perceiving this dimension of reality. How do you communicate with them? The main source of communication for them is telepathic. They, they, they do not speak. I know, of, I know of no extraterrestrials that speak. There may be some out there I've never seen or experienced any. Now, we don't communicate, obviously, telepathically on this plane. Why do you think you can communicate with them telepathically in another, let's say, area? That's a good question. It's medical fact or science fact that we use only, what, a very small percentage of our, our brains. I think that there are uh, muscles in our minds that lie dormant or that are atrophied. And I think that these muscles can be activated. So I think once you get around a, uh, an extraterrestrial's mind and they radiate or communicate telepathically, I think it begins to exercise the muscles that we have naturally that lie dormant. It wakes them up. Tell us more about the communication with symbols. Are there holographic images involved? They create holograms or images that literally hang in the air. For lack of a better explanation, I call it a hologram. For example? Uh, sometimes before an abduction, not always, I would get the uh, uh, courtesy of a symbol just before being pulled, I like to call it pulled, abducted, uh, to let me know what kind of abduction it would be. An example, a hologram of an owl would appear. When I would see something like that, that would tell me it's time for school. That's what would happen on that abduction. Some cases, um, a hologram of a, uh, a medical instrument Something like a forcep would appear, and that would tell me this abduction would include medical procedures or semen extraction. In the early years, Jim usually found himself sitting at a table in an almost completely paralyzed state. In front of him was a screen in which he was forced to learn an alphabet, a number system, and symbols. Over and over again, he converted our letters and numbers to what he thought was their letters and numbers. As time has gone on, I don't believe that now to be their alphabet per se. I think it was a common ground form of communication. Nothing about this, any of this is conventional. The symbols literally like the holograms hang in the air. Interesting about the symbols though, if I may explain. I had one experience where I read a story in, in regular uh, language that I understand, our language, and it, I would say it was probably about 20 pages long. They could take the same story and put it in their, in their uh, alphabet that I was explaining earlier, which would only take perhaps a half a page. And then they could condense that half a page to a 50 cent coin piece like symbol, and all you have to do is look at it and understand. The alien language must be done in what we would consider to be three-dimensional space. And that one of the problems of the communication between our species and this other species is that we still are relying on a two-dimensional kind of communication and a verbal stream of words, whereas this other intelligence relies on a three-dimensional, technologically projected symbol communication that is combined with telepathy. Obviously, their language is more condensed than ours and more effective as well. They have minds that think 10 to 100 times faster than ours do. They have to slow themselves way down to communicate telepathically. In fact, as, as uh, the more I got abducted, the less they wanted me to rely on telepathic communication and more on the symbolic communication. You described worker beings in your book. Right. What do you mean by worker beings compared to aliens? Is there a chain of command here? Well, I think it's probably the biggest reasons that extraterrestrials have been involved in, with humans hundreds if not thousands of years. I think that they, they take or extract the raw material that they need in order to create just that, worker beings. I think these are the same beings that uh, most abductees describe. They're the, the small, atrophied, large head, large teardropped eyes looking creatures. Those are the workers. And then there are the aliens that I call the true aliens, at least in the species that I'm familiar with. Uh, they're a little bit taller, and they seem to have a run of things. So yeah, there's, there's workers and there's 
supervisors, for lack of a better definition. Now, workers, is this a subspecies? Is it a, a created species? Yes, it's created purely. Obviously, one of the big questions that we have is uh, why are these encounters occurring uh, from the alien point of view? And uh, my own feeling is it's very difficult to uh, think like an alien. We don't know the answer to that question. We can only make uh, educated guesses. Uh, it does seem that uh, some of the so-called aliens are conducting genetic experiments. It does seem as if uh, human uh, women especially are being uh, impregnated, but uh, uh, human men are also uh, being um, taken, abducted, and, and sperm samples are taken from these men. The genetic experimentation, the creation of a kind of hybrid mix of them and us, uh, that that's the really central uh, uh, goal that, that uh, they're really centrally involved with. That's why they're here, really. But along with that is the idea that they're interested in studying human emotions, human sexuality, human feelings of love for one another, uh, especially feelings of maternal and paternal love for our children. All of the things that are sort of basically human emotionally. Besides semen and ova extraction, what else are they interested in? Emotions and uh, our ability to reproduce. Do they have emotions? No. None at all? If they do, it's a higher form or it's a form that I don't understand. The best way I could describe that would be if I was a child, an infant, and I wanted ice cream, although my father or my mother knew it would be time for a nutritious meal, I would scream and yell like a baby that I would be that I want ice cream and I would think mom and dad have no feelings and no emotions because they want me to eat vegetables. So perhaps if you can see where I'm going with this, this analogy, uh, as, as humans, our emotions relative to theirs, it's, it's almost the same thing. But uh, I'm not saying they all don't have emotions. I'm saying the ones that I've been dealing with or have been dealing with me, I should say, in particular, seem very emotionless. Uh, there are other races that seem to have emotions, and those are the, uh, the scaled ones. I think they're commonly for, referred to as reptilians. In a sense, it seems like they're almost farming us. In fact, I think you couldn't put it in a better way. I think that uh, they have been using raw materials from human beings to make these worker beings. Semen from men, genetic material, ova or eggs from women, and I think they've been doing this to human beings in secret maybe thousands of years. Besides raw materials for, let's say, worker beings, uh, what other resources do they need from us, or do they steal from us, in a sense? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily stealing. It's almost something like what we would do with cattle. Thank God they don't eat us. Uh, we do take care of a cow's medical need. We make sure that they have a nice pasture to graze on and, and so forth. Unfortunately, at the end, they end up at your grocer's freezer. As far as humans are concerned, uh, they've been extracting these raw materials for years and years and years. But I said one reason is they make these worker beans. Another reason I feel almost certain of is for their own longevity. Um, in other words, they have a technology that can extract um, um, tissue intact from a human, maybe one one thousandth in size. To give you an example, let's say uh, that field I told you they created, they can actually take one one thousandth of, an, uh, of the tissue in an elbow and you'd wake up in the morning and feel like maybe your elbow's sore. And they can take it and they can overlay it on themselves if the, if the genetic material matches up naturally and it would regenerate whatever the ailment they may have in the elbow. I think uh, that they form humans in that way. So it's more than a coincidence that we have somewhat similar body parts. I think so. And I think there's a universal rule, which is higher intelligence takes advantage of and uses lower intelligence, not unlike what we do to cattle. If, uh, as the evidence shows, the aliens are interested in um, this kind of ongoing genetic, shall we say tampering or whatever, at least the attempt apparently to connect uh, uh, their stock with our stock, uh, that would explain why they seem to follow a particular bloodline in a particular family. And so if a parent or parents have been abducted, uh, there is sadly likelihood that offspring will be abducted too. 
not necessarily all of them. And uh, perhaps another generation, another generation. I've got cases where there seem to be four generations that have had abductions in the same family. When you say they've been interacting with us for hundreds or even thousands of years, I mean, that's a you know, fairly serious implication. Do you right. think that they've genetically manipulated our DNA? There are reports that people have heard or been told that from abduction cases. They've, they've showed me that, for, for lack of a better dis, uh, definition or word, hologram-looking visuals that led back uh, human history all the way back to these ape-like looking creatures. So the impression I got and what they said as they were showing it was, yeah, we manipulated these cre creatures to make you who you are today. On April 9, 1983, I was working on a documentary project for Home Box Office when I had a meeting scheduled at Kerland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico with an Air Force Office of Special Investigations agent named Richard C. Doty. And in the course of that meeting, he told me something his superiors wanted to share with me, which was an alleged, it said, briefing paper for the President of the United States of America on the subject of identified aerial vehicles. And he told me that I could read it, that I could not take notes, and I could ask him questions. And as it began with a historic summary of our government's efforts to retrieve crash disks and non-human entities, both dead and alive, going back before 1947 into at least the 1950s in the paper that I read, it discussed a live extraterrestrial biological entity referred to uh, later by this man as Eba who communicated to our government that its civilization had been involved with this planetary history for millions of years, going all the way back to the dinosaurs. And as startling as that concept is, that their interaction with the Earth had involved life seeding projects, harvesting projects, mining projects, a whole series of things. And there was a sentence that said, these extraterrestrials manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapiens. And I remember reading that sentence over and over and over again, thinking about the implications. And another sentence in that paper that said, all questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapiens on this planet have been answered and this project is closed. All questions and mysteries about the evolution of the human species have been answered and the government has closed a project inquiring into that question. Is our military involved or world powers involved with this agenda? To me, clearly, yes. Probably the most remarkable experience that I ever had uh, was I had gotten pulled or abducted and I found myself out in uh, an abandoned, what I thought was a carnival yard or something. But I was out in this open area. There were about a dozen beings standing in a semicircle. Now you gotta understand, everything about this was different right from the beginning. I was not paralyzed. Uh, these, these beings were standing in the semicircle. They were huge, they were large, they were bigger than anything I've ever seen. And the first words, or telepathic words, out of, out of their mouths was that we would have just given it to you, but you wouldn't have understood that way. Meaning? Immediately I figured that to mean the knowledge of what they were up to with abductees, or at least myself. During this meeting, Jim was told that it was true that there was contact made between extraterrestrials and world powers. It was true our government was made aware of environmental problems. It was also true that among other things, technology was given to us in order to stop using nuclear weapons. And according to them, we broke our agreements by making weapons and money out of the technology exchanged. I think if you can take two generals or several generals and they're sitting back listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, well, they're benevolent. Uh, all of this is well and good. But my God, these guys can come and go in our skies as they please. They can take people in the middle of the night and there's nothing we can do about it. We need to buy time. We need to negotiate whatever needs to be done so we can catch up with this technology to defend against these guys. 
You know the military's gonna think that way. It's their job to think that way. It's they're sworn to protect this country. How else can they think? Why didn't they tell uh, the average citizen in that day that these things were happening? We were just getting out of World War II. Uh, Orson Welles' experience, I think, showed a lot. I think the closest thing to extraterrestrials in those days was a swamp monster relative to how experienced people are today. And of course, once again, the paranoia that these, these creatures can come and go as they please. What if, and I can, see, I can see military minds thinking this way easily, and I don't blame them. What if we didn't agree with what they wanted to do? What could we do about it? So I think that uh, in, in those days, they, they bought time. The human psyche as a whole, the, the collective consciousness of humanity is beginning to respond uh, to these stories and these events. Uh, and we are beginning to, um, to change our consciousness about uh, this subject matter. Not only has public awareness increased, evidence suggests that certain unnamed organizations who have knowledge to extraterrestrial existence would like to speak out publicly, but can't for fear of prosecution. I don't think the government fears so much that if it were to come forward with the truth, people would panic in the street, or the stock market would drop, the church would collapse. By God, we're human beings, we're resilient. Human beings have always been that way. I think they're more concerned with, gee, what are you going to do to me? Because in, for the sake of national security, I think a lot of human beings and, and honest, law-abiding citizens have been hurt, tremendously so. Perhaps life, plenty of lives have been lost over this secret. People have been maimed. People have disappeared. And this goes on and on and on and on for the sake of national security. If you provide an avenue for government officials uh, perhaps even private industry, to come forward and speak the truth about extraterrestrials without being prosecuted. A lot of the technologies that we have, because we do have technologies that can change things for energy, water, and, and all those things that we don't need to hurt the Earth to derive the things that we need. There's technologies that can overcome all of that without polluting the Earth at all. The Earth is on a catastrophic course right now with us at the helm because what we're doing is, is lethal to the future of the planet. Obviously, the fate of this host planet, then, is of concern to them. This common area that you hear repeated over and over in the human abduction syndrome about why uh, these interactions from a non-human intelligence is the focus on our environment, that we as human creatures are self-destructive, that we are damaging our own planet, and that in the process of this self-destruction of our environment, the implications for our future seem to be hanging in the balance. What touched me the most was they were really focusing on the environmental problems we're having. They really see these things literally from a different perspective, which is from outer space, high technology, perhaps from other dimensions, and they really see it as if we don't take care of it, we will no longer be here. That clear, cut, and dry. They tremendously focus in Central and South America and the rainforest. They made it crystal clear the burning of those forests has to stop. It's the heart, it's the soul, it's the lungs of the planet. It's the internal organs of Mother Earth. Sure, you can cut the hand off we may be disabled, but we keep going. Sure, you can lose an arm. Sure, you can lose both legs. You can be just a torso and live, which I sort of feel that's what the Earth is right now, because I think she's having a tremendous time cleansing and recycling herself. But once you get to the internal organs, nothing, as we know it, will be here anymore. And we're invading that right now as we sit here, as I speak. They made that very clear to me. We need to cut it off. It's going to go into 800 numbers we don't have anymore. Now. The 
that, uh, thank you for that, by the way. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but primarily, of course, you know, that was to educate us all. However, uh, in that, that gentleman, the, the, the narrator, Douglas Redante, excuse me, I thoroughly enjoyed and uh, it just did uh, my heart and my spirit joy to watch this individual uh, create this video. That was his baby. Um, and his interest in the subject was little to none except that he, uh, he had a, a little video production company at the time. And um, he, the only reason he was even out at, the, uh, at that conference, I believe it was Tampa, was because he was being paid to do some work on the UFO thing, so it wasn't really any interest of his. But uh, that day, when when I, we ran, we crossed paths, and I saw who it was, and I said, "Man, it's that guy." I bit my tongue and I kept my mouth shut for months, several months, and let this whole process take place, uh, and watch what had taken place on board and how it affected him. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. Uh, after, uh, and many others, many thousands, um, after six years of uh, being totally paralyzed, going through all these experiments, going through all their uh, agenda, extracting semen, uh, being forced to learn this, being forced to learn that, and a lot of traumatic things, and I reflect back at it now, and I, like I say, I understand the nature of the beast, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture. There was the first, one of the first experiences where I was actually turned loose. So instead of being, <clears throat> excuse me, paralyzed for uh, six years like I had been, I had been turned loose. I had gotten pulled, and when I um, regained consciousness, I found myself standing. And I was standing in a clearing in the woods that was uh, easily the size of uh, a football, football field or more. Uh, you could tell that they did just instantly somehow it cleared the woods and it was nothing but trees around us. And I went, where I was standing, there were about 12 or 15 people below me in a pile, either totally paralyzed, partially paralyzed. Uh, mostly they were nude, some were in their night clothes, some were in nightgowns, a few in pajamas. So you could tell that they had just been pulled from their homes and they were sleeping and they were sort of dumped there. Standing next to me was uh, the gentleman, Doug. What made, him, what made it different for him was the fact that he was standing, he was uh, zombified, so he wasn't 100% himself, and all he kept saying at first was, I was in my car, I was in my car. He just didn't know how he, how he ended up where he was. Myself, at the time, I was like, oh my God, I, uh, I can move. I'm not paralyzed. I'm not on board this craft in this room uh, being subjected to all this junk. What am I supposed to be doing here? And then to my left, this is what I'm thinking, I can move, so I felt this freedom uh, for the first time. And to my left was another um, pile of people, just piled up about 12 or 15 of them. And oh, incidentally, there was a gray next to me Next, in that other pile of people, there was another gray with them. And in the next uh, pile, there were uh, about 12 or 15 people. There were three with a gray. From our left were three balls of light in the horizon. And it was an overcast night, and I remember that clearly. Clearly that it was overcast, how's that? But I clearly remember it was an overcast night. And the first ball of light just zoomed across the horizon, across the sky, and hovered above the clouds, or the overcast clouds, above myself and, and the people I was near. The second ball of light came across and did the same thing. And then the third ball of light came across the third group. But mine was the first where I was started to descend and it descended through the clouds, and what I saw was uh, another first-time event, was the, the exterior, for the first time, uh, the exterior of a craft, or their, or their ships. It was a, um, 
Uh, the bottom of it was, it wasn't streamlined like I thought uh, uh, UFOs or should look like. I figured it'd be some streamlined, high-tech looking thing, but it was like the bottom of it was oval shaped, kind of off oval shaped. There were windows all the way around, and then there was a sphere around that. So it looked like it was 50, 60 feet across, and I could see, or maybe a 50 to 100, something like that. I'm not perfect in judging the, the width of things, but there was, uh, I could see a scurry of activity, and as that thing started descending through the clouds, it, uh, a light came on from the bottom of it, and it was an extremely white, 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 bright light with a hue of blue, of blue. And I thought that that was the most gorgeous, beautiful sight that I had ever laid eyes on. And so I just, I had my freedom, I was moving around, I was um, waving my hands in the air saying, it's beautiful, they're beautiful, because another one came down and did the same thing, and another one came over that pile of people and did the same thing, and I blacked out. Prior to those ships descending, when I was out there in that field, and that gentleman was talking about, I was in my car, I was in my car, and these people were sprawled out on the ground, um, I got the telepathic uh, voice from a Gray saying, calm him, because he was saying I was in my car, he was nervous. I had walked up to him and told him he was going to be okay. Uh, the nauseous feeling, the sick feeling that he, was gonna, that he was sensing or experiencing would pass. There was a girl, uh, a blonde-haired girl. She was on the ground, and she was, the rest of them were pretty much out of it, paralyzed, but she was sitting in the fetal position, and she was just rocking back and forth, scared to death. And I put um, my hand on her shoulder and, in essence, told her she would be okay. So now I'm thinking, my God, I got a job. And I, to, maybe it's... <laughs> It's, maybe it's like the uh, Helsinki syndrome where, you know, your, your captives are giving you some freedoms. But I wasn't going to mess it up because I had six years of nothing but being paralyzed with these guys. And I was going to calm these people. That's when the ships then later, as I described, descended. The light came on. I said they're beautiful, which they were absolutely gorgeous, particularly the light. I blacked out. When I came to, we were in a, a corridor. And in this corridor were um, all of the people that were splattered all over the ground that they had had in this clearing in the woods, and they were standing. Now, you've got to understand how I was at that time, because again, after six years of all that unadulterated hell um, and trauma and paralyzed, it was like everything was a new and fresh experience. And so now I'm standing there, and this guy, again, I keep pointing to that, but that's not up there, and it doesn't need to be, but that, that the Doug gentleman was standing to my right. So that's how I, why I had so much intimate contact with this guy, because he was constantly with me quite a bit during this scenario. And um, he was standing to my right, and then the tele and, and everybody else was standing behind me, and they just looked like zombies. These people were abductees. And then the telepathic message came, lead them. Lead them. So what is it? What? Lead them to slaughter? All these negative things can go through your mind, right? Um, and, but I knew it wasn't anything that would be dangerous. And so um, I grabbed his hand and I put it on my forearm. And as I walked forward and took steps forward, so did the people. It opened up into this huge thing that was uh, at least the size of a basketball gym gymnasium with all kinds of activity going on all against, up against the wall. And in this thing were nothing but rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of these little desk-like things with monitors, something that looked like monitors. The next telepathic message was, seat them seat them. So I took this guy and I started walking down an aisle one at a time. That's how I figured to do it. The, the rest of the crowd just stood there and all this activity was going on at the end of the, uh, this gymnasium-like room. I could see uh, ETs. I could even see humans interacting together. 
for what at the time I didn't know. And I took uh, that individual, seated him in front of his monitor at the end of that row, and as I started walking back, I stopped and I wanted to look around. I couldn't, I knew that if I'd stopped to look around, they weren't going to like it, but I wanted to see more what was going on, so I started to look around and the telepathic voice just went, no. And then I looked a little more and it just went, no, no, no. And I refused the command. <laughs> You know, my rebellious first day at work. And, uh, <laughs> and guess what? I blacked out. Uh, when I came to, uh, I found myself sitting at my monitor with everybody else sitting before theirs. So someone else had to finish the work. And, uh, but the room was just not filled with the individuals that were on the ground where we were, but there were several, maybe 100 more in these rows. You know, you've heard this uh, term, uh, scoop marks, that they talk about with abductions, there's a scoop mark. Well, people were, I don't mean to sound scary, because this thing wasn't scary at the end, but it, of course, they, we were hooked up, like a line was hooked up to our, um, either to our legs or to our arms. And I didn't understand what the line was, except I now know that it, uh, it, caught, it, it, it heightened sensation. It heightened your awareness because of what they were going to show us. So uh, as I was sitting there and found myself sitting there and seeing everybody else sitting in front of these things, the, all the monitors all lit up at the same time. And I always describe it the same way, like um, as if when you buy to, go to buy a color TV and they're, and they're uh, advertising the televisions and, and they have them all at the window and they're all playing the same channel. And it looked like that when the, when the monitors lit up in, the, in this huge room thing. And uh, the first thing that came on was a, there was a hum, a sound like a hum, for a few seconds and then appeared on this screen and everybody had the same thing was just The, it was the sea, and it was the ocean in pristine, perfect condition. Turquoise blue, beautiful ocean, teeming with fish. The sky was this awesome blue, and the air couldn't be any more clear. And, you know, and I say we were hooked up, so it intensified your sensation of it, and it was just the most drop-dead gorgeous scene you've ever seen of the planet, and it just took your breath away, and you just went, wow! It's gorgeous. Now this is the reaction that all these people are having in this room. That scene would dis disappeared and then another scene came out and it was mountains and they were beautiful mountains and they were snow-capped mountains and the air was blue. There were trees and it was just, and you knew, you knew that you were looking at scenes from maybe thousands of years ago or even maybe just hundreds of years ago of what the planet was like when it was in its perfection that way and you would just took your breath away. Gorgeous earth scene. That disappeared, and then you would see lakes, you would see forests, uh, one beautiful earth scene after the next, after the next, after the next, and everybody that was in this thing was just like mesmerized by it, in love with it. And then, slowly but surely, the scenes started to change, where the first one was, um, a beautiful, pristine sea with teeming with fish. The water was brown, ugly, and the fish were bloated, floating on the top. And you just, just the opposite sensation that's a natural because you're hooked up to this thing, whatever it was making these sensations, was, oh, God, I don't want to see that. And then the next scene showed the, uh, the mountains and then the acid rain or eating the top of the trees and the air was polluted and it just got dirtier and uglier and dirtier and uglier. And then this telepathic message that came across for every brain to hear at the same time was, you're killing your planet, your planet is dying. And then the next scene, you're killing your planet, your planet is dying. You're killing your planet, your planet is dying. You're killing your planet, your planet is dying. Horrific, I did not want to hear it, I did not want to see it, I didn't want anything to do with it. I kept starting studying myself personally, the bottom left of that monitor, because I saw symbols down there, because I didn't want to look at what I was looking at, it was horrible to me. And I thought I could read the little symbols down there, 
and the big N-O came across the screen with the telepathic message, no. The one word commands. <clears throat> but I kept looking at that because I didn't want to see that, that part, that reality, and then I blacked out. When I came to, all of this was over, and we were in something that reminded me of a, um, skipping through a little because I want to get the questions and answers, uh, what came through to a, um, uh, what was like a gymnasium area, and everybody was rocking and moaning and groaning, and they were, they, they, they had, pulled us together in a thing that it was smelled like body odor, like a locker room. People were still naked, half naked, whatever it was they were. And they had, where they had pulled out what we were attached to, which I believe a lot of that is what the scoop mark thing is when they see that on abductees. So they're hooked up to something in order to intensify whatever message that these guys are delivering, at least in my perspective and in my experience. And I think, uh, their clothes, our clothes, whatever were left of any clothes, because they were naked, that were, they were, you would think they would have them neatly folded and everything, like, okay, everybody put your clothes on. And so, but people were moaning and groaning, they were in pain and they were hurting, and, and then the telepathic message to me was, calm them. And so I was going to different individuals, and then again I came to that guy, and he stood out the most, and uh, he was complaining the most. <laughs> he was complaining about his arm, it hurt, and this hurt, and I'm saying, hey, look, man, you're gonna be okay, these things pass. Whenever I get cut on board, which is true, whenever I bang myself up, it heals real fast. These things heal real fast. And then I think something on a funny note, which was pretty funny, which was the telepathic uh, word, like a p telepathic PA for everybody in there, no one leaves until no one gets to go until you find your clothes and put them on. So all these people, and it is, it's, some of this stuff is funny, you know. So all these people complained and moaning and groaning and now are scurrying all over the place, all active. They got everything back, looking for their clothes, and it was over. The experience was done. God knows how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people were pulled. I knew that it had affected me. Uh, I formed a foundation at the time called Your Earth. It still exists. I don't want any contributions to it or anything. I know it's for a time. It is to save the rainforest. Um, uh, as you, in that video, uh, the thing with the uh, reptilians were telling us, uh, shared with me about creating or help to create an amnesty bill. So those officials who really know what's going on, who've been doing terrible things to people to keep this stuff secret, like killing, maiming, and discrediting, and all that stuff, so they can come forward and let's get all this mess out of the way. But I am, excuse me, I am starting to see more positive things about uh, our concern with the environment, with us accepting the fact that, gee, the earth is warm enough, okay? And we're taking that on an official stand. I'm seeing more positive things. And then it was just, it done, it done my soul such, such good to see one individual, just one of the many tens of thousands, if not hundreds, and who knows how many might be in this room right now that have been part of that mass abduction, uh, do their part for the environment. So at this point, uh, I think there's a few minutes for any questions that you might have. Hi. I enjoyed very much your talk. Where did you live when that happened? Um, I'm sorry, dear? Where did you live when that happened? That was, uh, when was I living? That would have been about 10 years ago. So at that point, I was in Florida. I was in southwest Florida, Sterile Island, Fort Myers Beach. And that particular event, that's where I lived, in Florida. Uh -huh. And then you, you just woke up in your bed again? It depends on where I was pulled, you know, my, things for me were a little bit unique. Um, after that scenario, I can't remember now. You know, I used to take meticulous to remember every single dot in detail. So, um, uh, and I did uh, start writing things down, and I think I might even have in the book, whether I woke up on the sofa or whether I woke up on the living room floor or whether I woke up in the bedroom, but it was inside my home. 
Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome, dear. Yeah, my question is um, what you were talking about today was all about uh, happened and concluded about 10 years ago. What has happened lately? Oh, well, let's see. Just to not take several hours. It's the interaction with the extraterrestrials, particularly the grays, has uh, evolved. Uh, the best way for me to answer that is um, I'm seeing things in timing for myself with uh, the, the book that's out and me getting, getting to share these experiences and, and educate the public at least when I say that in what I experienced and, and, and surmised. I'm seeing uh, uh, more concern with the environment and, and I'm seeing myself in time seems to be all lining up with the way we are right now and where we're going with that. Um, I think, though, for myself personally, um, the interactions have totally changed. They used to pull me in the middle of the night, rip me through the roof, so to speak, uh, drag me on board in a sense, fighting them tooth and nail, and I've had interaction now that um, is almost on human terms, where I, I get a warning, meaning that hi, we're coming, uh, I get notice, I shouldn't say warning. and. Uh, and then at times I actually physically go to places to have interactions instead of being pulled. And that was something I always practically begged for for many years. So that would be pretty much a progression that so way. The rest of the question. Um, since have they said any more or has anything else come clear to you as far as their agenda other than our environment? Okay. If, if the way I like to describe something like that is if, if their if alien agenda were 360 degrees, then I've got to intimately um, uh, share in one or two degrees of that 360. And if each degree had 100 agendas in it, then I've shared in, or experienced in one or two degrees within 100 of those agendas a dozen or so. Uh, primarily what I've come face to face with and seen has been um, the environmental issue with them, be it for them, be it for us, or be it for all of us. Uh, and I've also gotten to see a, a business aspect uh, associated with uh, what they're doing. Things that to me aren't very pleasant, but they've been doing it for God tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, which is uh, in the business respect, uh, as I mentioned in the video, they can, um, uh, they farm for raw genetic material. I know to, uh, to use to make worker beans, but don't let it scare you because you don't know what's happening to you. And also, don't let it scare you because it's nothing that any, anything that's taken from us in that respect with the high technology that they have to use it, um, it, it doesn't affect your longevity or in any way, shape, or form. There, so there, there's something there. There's an interest in them to make worker beans from what we are. There's an interest there to get uh, genetic material for all sorts of things that they use for themselves. And, uh, unfortunately, some of that has been from us. Again, it doesn't fa affect your health. It's just that it's done in secret, and you don't know it, and it doesn't affect you. So I've been familiar with those aspects of the uh, phenomena. Hi, I'm Linda. Since my experiences, um, the major ones in 1975, I've noticed several people have mentioned 1975 here. Um, one of them was environmentally related, maybe more than one. One, I was taken, it looked like I went right out through the screen in the window. Through the, I just got closer and closer to the screen until I went through a square. Mm -hmm. And then I was taken to see a scene of smokestacks, oil, things like that. And then I ended up in a place, in a clearing on the, in the forest. And then I seemed to have a way of being called back, my ears ring. And I've noticed sometimes I get this. Maybe some of you have an ear ringing. It's with me, it's the left ear is negative, the right ear is positive. I get warnings. So uh, like a ringing sound for a warning? That you're yeah. going to be abducted? When it first started, it was, it, I was driving down the Santa Ana Freeway. And it went off in my head. And I jumped. I almost hit my head on the ceiling 
of my car. And then since that time, I've refined it down as like binary, you know? Anyway, I've been playing around with this stuff. It looks like I have had contact, although when I first saw that light up on the hill, I hadn't even thought about UFOs or anything like that. But not long after that, I saw Betty and Barney Hill on the TV. And the whole time I was watching the movie, a nerve here and here buzzed, buzzed, buzzed the whole time during the movie. And the next day, my forehead was sore there. So I don't know what's going on, but I know it has to do with the environment. I'm sure it is. And I'm really worried. Well, well thank you for sharing that. Uh, there's just about three or four thank more you. minutes. But I, I should say, to add to that, thank you for sharing that, there is sounds associated with being pulled. There is no doubt. There are sounds like that, and you can hear ringing and whirling in your head associated with the technology of being abducted. And I'm glad to hear that it's an environmental thing again. Very simple question. Why do you have to take your clothes off during an abduction? If you were to ask me to come up on stage naked, I would have my third and fatal heart attack. <laughs> you know, I don't know, sir, what it is with this naked thing about us and our nature. I, you know, I don't know. You know. <laughs> but they were naked. What can I say? <laughs> the simple question is this: they, they, if if I can go through time, time is not. I'm sorry. If time is not a, uh, a variable, uh, time is a variable, excuse me, where I can go forward in time or backward in time. Right. And I can go from place to place as easily as, as they can. Correct. Uh, then I can see who is causing the environmental problems. I understand. And why don't I attack them instead right. of attacking you? I like, I like that. Okay, I, uh, gee, I, I got, I'm down to a minute here, uh, according to the queue. But I experienced uh, uh, time travel, I think, by accident. I was abducted, and I'll never forget this one. And I was brought, I was gone for two hours, and I was brought back two to three minutes before I left. Now here's this whole thing with all these theories. If you see your grandfather and you kill him, can you be born and this and this and that and all these things, almost like what you're saying here too in a sense. I'm not going to kill anybody. Yeah, I'm just if, going now, to if you were to shoot your grandfather, right, would you be born if you went back in time? Things like that. Well, when I came back, I saw myself two to three minutes and all the actions that I was doing two to three minutes before I was abducted, without going into the long story, because it is a neat story, I wrote about it, but nonetheless, what I saw was an individual, I could hear the sound, I could hear that person turning on lights, I can see, the, hear that, see that person open and close in a refrigerator, and, and as I was on my sofa where the person was about to come back to where to catch up with that two or three minutes, and I kept saying to myself, oh my God, is me going to see me? Is me going to see me? Is me going to see me? And as I turned around to come back, that self had absolutely no awareness of this self. So, and as that self came closer to the sofa where I was before this whole thing started and time was catching up with itself, it started to turn invisible or it started fading until it came very close and disappeared. So this business with taking care of the culprits or doing something, what I've learned throughout this whole thing is that the laws of physics, as we don't understand it, no, and it says time's up here, so I'm going to have to finish with this. The laws of physics, as we understand it, sorry, uh, do not apply. And it takes a tremendous, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of energy to make the smallest change when you travel time. It's the opposite of this butterfly effect from what I'm seeing. Anyway, folks, I'm going to be uh, in the lobby area. Uh, I got books there. If you'd like to, uh, I'll be signing books there. That would be kind of neat. And I apologize for not having more time to answer any more questions, but I'll be happy to do that over there. And I want to thank you for um, giving me the opportunity and others like me to present this material to you.